Thanks, everybody. It's really uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I have to say, yesterday I was listening to uh, some of the panel discussion and, and uh, some of Terry's remarks in particular just uh, made me think I had to redo the whole talk. So that's what I did. I'm giving a different talk today. I was going to talk just about how we built the whole cell model. Um, today I'm going to talk about what we use it for. And I thought it would be nice to start with, uh, with a quote from one of my heroes, uh, Jacques Monod, who's uh, obviously, you know who he is, and he's sitting there with Barbara McClintock. Um, he said, he, this, this quote is attributed to him, okay? Never trust an experiment that is not supported by a good theory. And I, I think that quote's so interesting because it kind of flies in the face of some of the, the approach that I think a lot of us have just shooting from the hip, like in this era of big data, we tend to say, never trust any theory that doesn't fit all of the experiments. But of course, uh, Francis Crick, he was uh, confronted with this quotation, and, and in a book I read, he, he wrote that um, they would not have actually come up with the, uh, the model for DNA uh, if they had taken all of the experiments at face value. So they had to judiciously and selectively ignore some of the data to be able to come up with the double helix. And that's an important thing to, to think about. So I want you to, let's think as I kind of go through here, uh, when do you trust the experiment and when do you trust the model? So as Terry was saying, you know, Crick, the same Crick said, you know, don't fall in love with your model. And I, I have to admit a little bit of an attachment to, to mine that I have to probably get over. So um, hang on one second here. So as Masiek was kind to note, we did report uh, construction of a whole cell model uh, earlier this summer. Here's just one of the animations. I don't have time to go through the whole thing. Um, it's not at the same kind of particle level as these kind of gorgeous things we've seen in the synapse. Uh, there is some spatial representation, but what it tries to do is take every gene into account and every molecule into account and all of the annotated functions into account. And so there are all these different views. Um, you can see here a, a number of proteins that are binding to the chromosome. Now it's just replicated. Replication initiation is done. You can see the production of monomers and complexes in the cell. You can see the energy usage of all of these different processes in the cell. And so taking all of that stuff together, like I said, it's been really fun for us to, to look at and kind of get an idea about. But what I really want to talk about today is now that we had this, we spent some time thinking, you know, what in the world are we going to do with this? Okay. Uh, what, what do we do with the whole cell model? How do we, again, going back to Terry's comments, get the biological insights out of a model like this? And so we've been trying to do some things. Uh, we've run many, many simulations now and trying to just compare them to all kinds of data. Normally, I'd go into this slide in detail. But the general idea is that we're now able to compare our data. I mean, it's kind of nice to have a model of a, a cell because you can just compare it to any data set you see, really. And so uh, we've tried to to just really span all of the different data that's been generated in this organism or in roughly related organisms. So we've looked at the metabolome, and we've made comparisons there. Fluxome, this is supposed to be the transcriptome and proteome. I could show you many more graphs, but the, the overall idea is that we've compared this and kind of benchmarked it against all of the literature that we could find that we could test it to, and it, and it seemed to match up pretty well. Now that was in the wild type. Uh, we've also been looking at a lot of knockouts. And uh, so we took all of the knockouts, we simulated them, we went through and we made it. You can see a little truth table here, so we're able to capture these would be correct predictions, okay? And so we roughly can predict qualitatively, okay, the outcome of knocking out all of the different genes. And I'll notice here just uh, the 71 here that are where the model is predicting that they're not essential and the experiment is shown to be essential, those are generally the genes. It's highly enriched for genes where we know a little bit about them, but not very much. So it's a very coarse grain. It's kind of a, a worse description. Uh, and, and so that's interesting in its own right. So many groups have done things like this, right? A qualitative prediction. So people who are kind of in the large scale network modeling, they've done qualitative predictions of, of knockout phenotypes. But um, we wanted to take this. Uh, ahead a step and do something that no one's done before, which was to look at all these phenotypes quantitatively to measure quantitative growth rates. And so we did that. Um, and so that's what you're going to see here. Oh, sorry. I should say this is my slide to remind me. The Venter Institute was uh, gracious enough to let me come hang out there for a week and teach me how to grow all of these organisms so that we could do it in-house in the lab. So we've grown all of these things. and. 
what you see here is uh, these are, you know, this is the roughly 100 strains that are non-essential in mycoplasma genitalium. The red is what we predicted the growth rate would sh should be, and the blue is what it actually was. And so uh, you can see a lot of time we're close, but you have to take that with a big grain of salt because a lot of the time nothing happens, right? So you kind of have to ignore that part. We're not really interested in patting ourselves on the back for getting a prediction right. We're much more interested in trying to diagnose why we got things wrong. So there are about 15 to 20 cases where we essentially blew the prediction. Uh, and you can see those here. There's a little valley here that basically shows you know, how significant a difference we see. And the nice thing, though, is every simulation is not just giving us like one growth rate. It's giving us half a gig of data. So we can just go in and we can look and, and we do what I call a molecular pathology. We try to see what happened and why we got the prediction wrong. So I just want to start with one little story here. It's um, THYA. Okay, so there's a knockout there. It results in a 25% decrease in the growth rate. We were not able to predict it. So now we're going to go into that molecular pathology and just to, to keep things short, what we see, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but what we see is that the gene in question, okay, THYA, is required to produce DTTPs, okay, for the organism. And there's another enzyme that can potentially salvage that, TDK. I don't have time to explain how we came up with it. But we found this enzyme, TDK, that really was the one that could potentially rescue that, uh, that phenotype. And in our model, we have a TDK. But one thing that's interesting about the TDK, and here's a complicated figure that I have to explain. Um, so what you see here on the left, these are all the possible growth rates of THYA okay, in the model. So we modeled it at many different growth rates. And we did it by increasing the maximum throughput of that enzyme, TDK. Okay? And so what you can see here is that if you have a TDK value here, you get this different growth rate. Okay? So originally, we pulled our TDK estimate from another organism because that was the best information we had. So we pulled it from that organism. And it gave us a growth rate that was wild type. Okay? However, now, look at this green line. This is the distribution of the experimental data that we had of the measured growth rate. Okay? So based on that growth rate, we can go back and we can say, okay, we got this wrong. We think that the reason is that this enzyme KCAT is different than what we originally estimated. Okay? It's very interesting because we're taking a totally, like we're taking this growth, knockout growth phenotype, and we're using it to reach down into the protein level and say, what's the KCAT of that enzyme? So this is kind of, uh, it's really been the most exciting kind of month of the year. It's been very fun. Jayadita Songvi, one of my students, she went in, she cloned TDK into E. coli, okay? And she went through, thanks. This is a, a haynes wolf plot where she's basically just measuring the KCAT of that enzyme that she's purified, expressed and purified in E. coli. And so she came up with the new experimental range. And I would never have, uh, have believed this if you just told me it was going to happen. But here's what we originally guessed with the model. Okay, or sorry, here was our original estimate that we pulled from another organism. Here's what we guessed with the model. And here's the range that we pulled out by experiment. And uh, so when I saw that from J.D., at first I told her to go repeat it a few times, of course. And then I, um, and then I told her, well, this is, like, uh, this is your lucky month. You're not going to have anything like this for many years, probably. Uh, but then two weeks later, she showed up with this, which was another one of those genes where we were resolving the discrepancies. Okay? And again, in this case, we underpredicted. So here our original estimate was low. The model said, look, there's actually a pretty big range you could have here to make these things fit. And when we measured it, there it was right in the range. And then she did it again. So this is last week. Uh, we had a prediction up here, or our original estimate up here. The model predicted something a couple orders of magnitude less. And again, the, the range that we measured experimentally is right in the ballpark. So what does all that mean? Uh, I'm not quite sure yet. But what's really exciting about this is just going back to this comment by Mono, right? And these comments by Crick. What do you trust? Do you trust the experiment? Never trust an experiment that doesn't match a theory? Do you say never trust a theory that doesn't match an experiment? So what I'm hoping starts to happen, we're trying to figure out how to teach the two aspects to trust each other, right? To be able to go back and forth and say, okay, 
we're learning about each other, and hopefully we're going to converge to something that really gives us some new insights. So, uh, so there it is, my two cents. And uh, I just want to end by thanking the people who did the work. Jonathan and Jadita, uh, really two amazing graduate students who did pretty much all the heavy lifting with the model. And of course, we had a lot of other, other help in the lab. And then finally, I just want to thank the, uh, the NIH, uh, particularly the Pioneer Award, for taking a chance on a long shot. So thanks. Thank you.